and welcome to the show. This upload is coming to you November 23rd, 2016, and you're listening to the Post Money Plan Podcast. Today's episode is hosted by myself, Dallas Post, founder of the Post Money Plan, as well as Stephen Gao and Murray Williams. We're going to talk about the implications of Trump's economic policies. Our intention here is to concentrate the discussion on the policies and not about Trump himself. Last time in part one, we covered a few policies, including fiscal stimulus through government infrastructure spending, and then we also debated renegotiation or withdrawal from international trade deals such as NAFTA and TPP, and then we closed up with discussion of exacting tariffs on domestic companies attempting to outsource, and then foreign companies that are attempting to import at much lower prices than domestic companies. This time in part two, we'll discuss tax simplification, tax cuts, and a potential tax holiday for overseas business profits, deregulation of the energy industry, elimination of Obamacare, deportation of illegal immigrants, and a hiring freeze on federal employees. Stephen, if you could just introduce yourself. Uh, Yeah, sure. My name is Stephen. I work at the Department of Medicine at UCSF as a research financial analyst. Essentially, I I manage the investment funds for medical research for the Department of Medicine. Okay. And Murray? Yeah, my name is Murray Williams, and I'm a former stockbroker and bond broker, and I've worked in the IT sector, and I'm also a former professional blackjack player, and hold several security licenses, including the Series 65, and I'm an investor as well. All right. So like I said before, we just want to focus very specifically on the potential positive or negative economic impacts of the policies that Trump proposed in the event that they are implemented. And so in terms of the proposed tax simplification and tax cuts and a tax holiday for overseas business profits, what do you think about that, Stephen? The dynamics of having a change in the tax cuts and tax laws is to a certain essence, they should be symbiotic because Mm -hmm. people right now are curious to see how the overall economy could thrive from tax cuts. It's like economics, you gotta have trade-offs. So these tax cuts, what would a change in the tax code do for the overall worker or the overall American economy? When George W. Bush came in, our economy was at a surplus after Clinton left office. And so he provided tax cuts, which immediately uh, helped out everybody's uh, disposable income. And in terms of a tax holiday for overseas business profits? I'm not sure if I read about the tax holiday for overseas business profits, but is that related to overseas, like tax haven? Well, so uh, right now, American companies that are earning a lot of profits overseas, especially Apple, for example, if they earn it overseas and they intend to keep it overseas and they don't repatriate it back to the U.S. to invest in the U.S., they don't have to pay American tax on it. But if they would try to bring it back to the U.S. to reinvest in the U.S., they would then have to pay an American tax on it. And so over time has actually discouraged American companies from repatriating their profits and they keep it overseas. And so there's been a debate in Congress for a while now to negotiate, Okay, how can we eventually come to some kind of agreement on a tax holiday for businesses of some sort? But unfortunately, the politicians have postured to use it as a negotiating tool for other things. So nothing's been done for a while. So it's basically a mechanism that just keeps American firm profits from being repatriated back to our our country? Yeah, exactly. And so the thought is, if there was a law passed that would either bring down the tax rate for repatriated profits or give a window of an exemption or something, that we would see a windfall of American businesses bringing back that money to the U.S. and then reinvesting it domestically. Going back to uh, tax simplification, it's like you got a problem, and I think it has to do with the income tax itself is actually a flawed way to actually collect taxes. And if you look at the history of the income tax, it was really designed as more of like a social thing as opposed to generating revenue. And if you have organizations or, or nations that don't collect the income tax, say like the Cayman Islands, for example, which last time I checked doesn't have an income tax, then companies have incentive to actually relocate to the Cayman Islands legally. They can pay no tax, especially if they're an international entity. You know, that's where you kind of have to put the pressure on government to cooperate, both sides of the pew, to come up with a comprehensive and innovative way to make sure that they collect the revenue that's coming from their citizens so that they invest it in the people correctly as well. Related to Murray's point, 
this goes in direct contradiction to Keynesian economic thinking, but taxing or in a sense penalizing production or income is the wrong way to do it. And really taxing or penalizing consumption would be a much more positive benefit for society because, again, this is in direct contradiction to Keynesian thinking, but you should actually encourage production and discourage consumption so that you get a net positive production. Whereas the way the economy is designed now is to encourage as much consumption as possible. And Mm -hmm. that encourages waste and just inefficient use of resources. Interesting, because I feel like we are in a state where we are predominantly consumers or perceived to be, you need to spend this, buy this, and we have all these targeted marketing procedures and mechanisms online that convince us to just consume, 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 and improve the GDP. But we're also at a state where, from things like the stock market, where the worker can also be a stakeholder. So he can have, or he or she can have both the consumer and the producer feel of the economy, so to speak. So you mentioning the contradiction of the Keynesian perspective, I'm more curious to see how we can maneuver that, that frame of thought where we can incentivize people to not just be known as the consumer, but also to be the producer. So I'm really interested in, in that challenge of the Keynesian principle. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, you got to give people an incentive to produce. And yeah. so it's basically you have to incentivize people to work and penalize non-work. A famous economist once said that the best way to do that is actually lower marginal tax rates and also reduce the welfare state. Because if people have the incentive to not work and they know they're going to get government benefits, they're not going to want to work. Was that Milton Friedman? That sounds like a Friedman thing. I think it was another guy. It wasn't Freeman. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a guy similar. In, in What's so funny, Dallas? I think it was it's just some kook. <laughs> some economic hack, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually a good theory, and it makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, if yeah. you, you allow people, you incentivize people to work and discourage non-work, it's probably the best way to do it. This is an anecdote from way before the United States is when, when the first settlements in the New World happened and they tried socialism. And it was basically how they would just share goods with everybody and share and share income equally. And what happened was was that they were just end up with a few people doing all the work and a lot of people not doing any work because they were just all getting the same thing. So you have to incentivize work and production. And to me, I, I believe that the income tax falls more heavily on the wage earner and not necessarily on the business person because companies can reduce their income tax if they just, businesses that is, if they just reinvest their profits into greater production and that reduces their taxable income as far as the money they got to pay tax on. But a wage earner always has to pay tax because he's getting that wage and boom, that's it. So, Yeah, that's true. Okay, so just bringing us back, so what do you guys think about deregulating energy industry? I think it's a good thing to deregulate it. It's always because there's been over-regulation of the energy industry, especially the environmental types not wanting to do any kind of energy exploration on American soil, which I think is a mistake because it hurts the energy sector and drives up energy prices overall. And we're talking about the Trump policies as far as the Obama administration pretty much regulated the coal industry out of business. I see where you're going, and I just feel like having a transition, you know, you can't just have absolute stop of one industry and then advance by saying, okay, climate change is, we're going to adopt all these new uh, energy policies. You have to have a smooth transition, keep one functional, but then open avenues for creating right. incentives for right. investing in new energy. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of the problem in terms of trying to manipulate an economy ahead of schedule or before it naturally would get somewhere. Oh, totally, yeah. There is a healthy transition towards renewable energy in the future, but you have to allow the economy to get there because if you don't allow it to, you're going to force inefficient production and it could end up costing a ton of money before we're ready to do it because we don't have the proper development in place yet. Like the space race, the technology was still nascent and not quite, you know, we had just had the Wright brothers, what year did they first fly? And then we're trying to get into space to beat the Russians to the moon. What did that accomplish? Were we ready for that? Was Were those resources worth it? There's a time and a place where, yes, it probably is very much worth it, but was it worth it at that point in time? I mean, I definitely like the idea of clean energy, and I don't think anyone dislikes the idea 
but you get to the problem where it may not be economically feasible. A couple of years ago, it's like wind farms were like the thing. But the last couple of bits of research I've seen is that creating a rotary wind windmill that creates energy is actually it costs so much more to build that edifice than it's actually then you get energy from the wind turbine. And so it never really makes money building a wind turbine. It's just a waste of money. And so it's, if you get where the government tries to interfere in the energy sector and try to stimulate a certain type of energy production when the technology doesn't exist for that kind of energy production yet, it could be a drag on the economy, definitely. Yeah, so I, I agree with what you're saying is you know, when you have something that's been established for years, the oil industry is like something that's been well established and has strong aggregate demand, different products from medical equipment to consumer goods. A litany of things are utilized and a lot of that comes from oil being a preponderant natural resource. Having said that, there is a change in impact happening on our planet. In order to bring that to the attention of liberals, conservatives, or whomever, just any any citizen that's willing to listen to policy change, what Dallas said is, is I agree, you have to have a natural state of evolution to manipulate an industry in absolute. Doing something in absolute as to shut one off and then open another is really hard to pull off. So I'm open to having more of a dynamic and smoother transition to create incentives to open avenues for, for cleaner energy sources while still you know having the established energy industry at its place. And that's where the challenge comes. Is if one person is being offered an incentive to produce cleaner energy, eventually it's going to marginalize the current market share holders of the energy industry. So a lot of compromise has to come into it, but I agree with what you guys are saying is you, you can't have an absolute change in demand. So I do see deregulation as a good thing in terms of job creation and helping out the economy because we've been so used to that for years. But then there should also be incentives to utilize new energy, cleaner energy, I should say. Well, I mean, I think that there are incentives in the sense of if yeah, but the technology... I, I feel like not an, okay, so you said technology. There's not enough development for people to really understand... I was reading the other day about water. It's such a inelastic, demanded good, but it's really scarce in certain places. So we need to have more of a cunning approach, innovative approach to make things like that more accessible and, and more functional, more efficient. I really believe that government involvement in trying to incentivize clean energy is detrimental. I believe that clean energy will happen, but it will happen through the private sector. When there's a major technological breakthrough that you can produce a massive amount of clean energy, like for instance, one aspect of clean energy is actually nuclear power, which actually creates a lot of electricity, a lot of power, but there are politics that are de-incentivizing nuclear power production. But right. when the government tries to get into incentivizing clean energy, it creates so much inefficiency and it's just a waste of money. Yeah, I mean, I always have this thing with technology. It's a promise and a peril. Whenever something's created, something naturally is, has to be compromised or potentially or completely destroyed. In recent history, over the last couple of hundred years, we've seen a natural evolution from a lot of wood-based energy, then transitioning to coal, which transitioned to oil, which has given way to more natural gas and a little bit of renewables now. And I think there's a natural progression that will and should happen. I just worry about trying to force one thing or the other. Natural liberty. Look at you getting your Adam Smith on. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to go back that far, we should talk about whale oil. Oh, right. <laughs> because they used to be a massive power source before they discovered crude oil. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, they used to hunt whales all the time. It's like that's what Moby Dick was all about. They hunted uh, whales for their oil. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the contentious one, uh, eliminating Obamacare. What do you think on that, Stephen? It's, no, it's funny because I feel like part of him saying eliminate, eliminate just was just to get the voter base on his side. But in the reality, when you come in as a president, there's so much you got to deal with. You can't just 100% scrap it unless it's really a quiet wire. I think that Mr. Trump recently did say this about amending it instead of eliminating it completely. If you look at the foundation of it and just focus on where the private sector could improve certain things that the government is not doing, yeah, okay, tackle those and be strategic about it. But if it's going to be more laborious and time-consuming and more expensive to remove the whole thing and implement a new thing, you know, frankly, it could take his own term. So to be smart about it, and I think Trump is going to approach it this way, is just to analyze the pros and cons, as with any uh, presidential act, and just look for things to improve. 
And that's what Obama did when he took after Bush's uh, AGOA Act, the African Growth Opportunity Investment Act. And so it's just another example. Like if this is one law that's been implemented from prior time, how do we add on to it, improve it, evolve it, so it's more efficient for the American people? That's that's my take on it. You see, I don't think you can fix a lemon, and <laughs> Obamacare is a lemon. <laughs> and if you try to put more resources, you're just throwing that money away. The idea of Obamacare was inherently flawed, and I believe that Obamacare is a larger drag on the economy than what a lot of people believe, especially the tax regulation, because there's a certain tax that kicks in on small business if you hire more than 50 employees. And so that creates the incentive or it de-incentivizes small businesses from expanding beyond 50 employees. And that is one of the major hindrances of Obamacare, and not mentioning the ridiculous out of control spiral premiums, but my opinion, it'll be difficult because the Republicans, they only have 52 seats in the Senate, so you need 60 for cloture, and so the Democrats are probably going to filibuster a full repeal. Trump may have to just try to get repealed on, on the really abhorrent things, especially the individual mandate. We're getting into political discussion here, but that's all right, because economics is political. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. I think that Trump will actually get a lot of support for feeling it out right. From a time-wise perspective and a costly perspective, if Republicans spend all the time repealing it in absolute, do you think that's more efficient than just amending or tweaking certain parts that are really dampening down the budget? Well, I mean, to repeal it, all it takes is a majority vote of Congress and a president's signature. Right, right. So... So but do you I mean, think like re- full replacement should be adhered to or, or situational-based replacement? I feel like the intent was a good thing to offer more insurance to the American people. I think a recent article came out that the premiums are supposed to increase next year. So everyone's kind of apprehensive about its subsistence in the long run. So I'm a fan of changing it, obviously, and improving it. But to remove it in completely, I'm not sure if that would be as much of a forward-thinking process for our current president and other things. Well, kind of like what we were saying on the energy topic, everyone's an advocate of coming to sustainable energy in the same way that everyone's an advocate of everyone as much as possible having health care available to them. The issue comes in with how that's done and is it possible or is it affordable? In the implementation of Obamacare, there's pundits to no end who will have opinions both ways. But in trying to get people who didn't have coverage before covered, then that means the people who already were covered and part of insurance plans, that means the insurance companies have to now price in the implication of the people who were previously uncovered. And that means it's going to cost the insurance providers more, which is going to then cost the people who were previously paying more. Now, there could be cases where that is a worthwhile expense in terms of a social justice kind of perspective for society. But then it comes back to what we were talking about with concern of welfare handouts. Well, actually, this is one part of Trump's economic plan I'm really interested in because he said something about a health savings account. So I think if we could correlate offering health insurance to American citizens with offering them financial instruments where they can save for the long run, that would be a boon for our economy. Health savings accounts would definitely be a superior road to take in what we're doing now, and I wish Democrats pushed that instead of Obamacare. Obviously, I'm biased against Obamacare, but one of the main selling jobs of Obamacare was to provide for people who are uninsured. And actually, if you look at the stats, that the uninsured rate was reduced, but not by a lot. And so the argument is is that they could have done something to reduce the number of the uninsured without screwing up the entire health care system for the middle class. Because it's really the middle class taxpayer who needs health insurance. Because if you're a wealthy person like Donald Trump, you don't need health insurance because you can just pay for all your stuff out of pocket. And so you want to keep premiums and health care costs as low as possible for the middle class and provide the uninsured with decent insurance. But actually, you get to think that some people actually choose not to have insurance. In fact, I didn't get insurance for many years and I didn't really need it because I was a healthy person. And there are actually many Americans who choose to completely forego health insurance and they just get accident or catastrophic health care plans. But Obamacare did away with those plans. So I think it would be economically a wonderful thing to just completely repeal Obamacare and start over from scratch with something different, a completely different paradigm. There still are those catastrophic plans, but you would still incur the tax penalty 
which went up to two and a half percent of your yearly income for 2016. Anyway, there was one other point about taking away the borders around states for insurance companies so that insurance companies could compete intrastate. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. a good idea, actually. I think that's a good idea. Which hopefully would bring down premiums with competition across insurance companies. Okay, moving on. Obviously, there was a lot of discussion and debate and contention on the deportation of illegal immigrants. What were your thoughts on that, Stephen? For me, to be honest, this campaign has been more of an issue for me socially than it has been, I guess, economically, because I feel like... Which is probably the case for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, coming out of college, I studied finance and economics, and I'm a big fan of Milton Friedman, so I'm kind of more biased towards, you know, being fiscally conservative. But my parents immigrated to here from Kenya in the 70s, and so as a first generation, I, I feel for those who are concerned about having their family split apart. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's almost like what we talked about earlier with the issue of the income taxes and how having tax avoidance has become a social thing. This is almost on par where it's too much of a social thing to not really limit or, or effectively regulate the process of becoming a naturalized citizen. But having said that, historically, we've always been an immigrant-seeking country. It's always improved economies, and people come here from different pockets of the world and create jobs and start businesses. So, I don't know, it's really hard to just write an executive order and just kick out a bunch of folks, but you got to have a constructive means, and so that's my take on it. I think naturally the general inclination of countries should be pretty open, barring any, like, I don't think we should be, like, welcoming in convicted murderers. I don't think that's a good policy. But in general, I think a country should allow people to ebb and flow as they please as much as possible because the world doesn't exactly just belong to one people or one country. But a country's policy towards immigration should be inverse to its welfare or its entitlements. So I would be a big fan of a country having very few entitlements and very open immigration. So in that way, you would allow almost anyone to come into the country and they would be encouraged to if the economy was good and there was opportunity and people had a chance to be free, then people would be incentivized to come to a country. But the more entitlements a country has, the more people will want to come to that country and then partake in those entitlements. And not if do anything exactly, not work. So basically, I think we should get rid of entitlements and then let people come, whoever wants to be here. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. I like how you're looking at it from a mathematical perspective. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So if we're going to moderate or change one thing, we should consider what the inverse relation with another component of the economy would be. So that's, that's a very interesting frame of reference. There are several Northern European countries that have a more socialist or higher entitlement style government and society, but that has worked for them in the past because of their natural resources and their small populations that are homogenous in terms of culture and ethnicity. Somalia. Yes, yeah, small population is a big thing. We're a diverse nation. We're a big population as well, so... But now that actually, since you're seeing all that rapid immigration, even to Northern European countries, you're kind of seeing a shakeup. Well, I mean, that's more of a cultural issue, but... The immigration has always been a hot-button political issue in the United States. And if you look at immigration history in this country, there was like a massive immigration wave that happened around from before 1900 through 1915. And it was actually in Calvin Coolidge in the 1920s they just decided, we're just going to stop immigration, period. Just cut it off completely. And back then, there was no welfare entitlement state, but the welfare entitlement state didn't happen until the 1960s. So people were coming in, regardless of whether they could get on the dollar or not. Yeah, I think immigration outside of things like natural catastrophes and war is going to be probably a slower, more natural thing that the economy could adapt to. But in cases of an earthquake or a tsunami or a war, like what's happening in Syria right now, that's creating an unnatural wave of immigration where people are forced out of concern for their lives to relocate. When you talked about Syria, I was reminded about Russia and their involvement with that issue. But now that Trump has been elected, Russia said they're willing to open negotiations or just open discussions with the U.S., which I'm curious from like the corporate state of mind. I'm curious to take advantage of because Russia is one of the biggest countries in the world and they have a lot of potential. Their economy has a lot of potential to be a strong exporter. They have a strong agricultural infrastructure. But there is that oligarchy cloud that still has impressions of the Soviet era. 
But having said that, just because of the size of their economy, we need to have some sort of open dialogue with them, even if it's on a minimal level. But I think that in the long run could help improve issues related to social injustice like you're seeing in Syria. Anything that's going to lead to more of the cliche of world peace, in my opinion, is a good thing. I feel like I'm channeling Hillary here when I say this, but I do really believe that we're stronger together. <laughs> but what I mean by that is that a Machiavellian style where every country tries to tear down every other country so that it's itself is higher than the rest, I think is less effective for the world than every country trying to benefit each other. And then in doing so, they make themselves stronger and wealthier. Yeah, that all goes back to the fact, you know, is economics a zero-sum game? And it's really not. In a free society where economies produce and trade, everybody benefits. And so it's really not a zero-sum game, unlike what a lot of people believe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just think that the important thing is just communication. I think oftentimes with politics and what people get skeptical about is that there's this subterfuge. Politicians will say one thing and then communicate something else. When WikiLeaks published Hillary's speeches to the Wall Street banks, something where she mentioned it's important to have a public and a private persona, which I feel like when the American voters saw that, they're like, we need someone that has to be open and frank. So I think open line of communication is key. So I'm interested to see how Russia will react to our action and vice versa. People who have a different public and private view, it means you're two-faced. Yeah. I have this thing where I just, any politician, whatever their background is, I'm just going to automatically label them as being two-faced. Like, you have to. Be so <laughs> I think there's going to be an entire generation of people who are going to feel that way. Oh, you yeah, have to. That's why I don't want to be a politician. <laughs> but that's why I like being an economist, because at the end of the day, it's like political economies. Whatever the economists say is what the politicians naturally have to follow, because that's they're acting on the people and... Economics is kind of like the business of life. We have to have this approach to free trade and a competitive advantage in creating a system that works and that's efficient and that gives us natural liberty and prosperity and world peace. That sounds like Ludwig von Mises right there. <laughs> and economics is relatively new to the realm of the sciences. There's so much room for growth and that's where a lot of people should be focused on. Well, I, I can't wait till we move on and graduate from the Keynesian side. <laughs> Or go back to the Austrian style thinking. All right, so in terms of the proposal to do a hiring freeze on federal employees, any thoughts on that, Murray? Yeah, I think that would be a really good thing that would really reduce the size of government. And from a Keynesian perspective, you're not going to like it because the Keynesians believe that if government spends money, it's good for the economy, increases aggregate demand. But Milton Friedman came along and blew all that out of the water. So I think that hiring freeze on federal employees will be a good thing. Yeah, it's like the government can only do so much until they become the actual problem. That's actually a good point. Yeah, but then what's the incentive here? Like what kind of approach or breakthroughs are we trying to resolve? Like with DARPA, the internet evolved from DARPA, and that was a government I thought it was Al Gore. (laughs) 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 Nice. Uh, yeah, I know, but DARPA was, uh, it was a government-sponsored program to increase defense spending, and that was the height of the Cold War, so to speak. But that, that naturally, that spawned the Internet. You know, just not to get too political, but in terms of size of government, I see a lot of things that the Republican Party says that I agree with and are interested about. But then I also see, like, from the welfare side of things, is how do you look after those who are disenfranchised? So... The last eight years, we've kind of seen the latter, so I'm interested to see how we can put the former in action. I think it's a question of, it comes down to efficiency. Who can do it better? Private business is going to much more easily be able to build a bridge, but private business is going to struggle to provide a a federal military that protects the whole country. I don't think a business is going to be able to organize to do such a thing. So... You need government to do things like security and protect the country, but private business is going to do a lot better job of construction, for example. Yeah, it's, it's government has to supply the defense of the country, absolutely, and there's no other higher calling for government than to do that. But then there's also that social welfare aspect where you don't want to encourage non-work, but you, right. you do want to have a, a certain degree of providing for those who aren't given opportunities. 
if everyone's looking out for their own best interest in the purely Adam Smith capitalist sense, you do have to have an overriding factor, aka the government, to come in to a certain extent and portion out resources. I think where you're going is public education, and, and I think that the government does a pretty good job of that. So that pretty much wraps things up for us. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Post Money Flame Podcast. 